not only have we shown that factorization machines can contain a lot of information and they can be computed quickly, They're, they can even be trained quickly. Um, so typically, so what you, what you have here is you, you need to estimate these parameters and um, typically you have to do some sort of stochastic gradient descent in order to um, optimize your parameters. Um, so you basically, you test out a bunch of different points and see like what your loss function is, um, which and the loss function will measure how far the estimate is from, uh, how the difference between the model estimate and what the model should have predicted, like the, um, what the actual um, value sh should be. Um, and so typically um, models are really complex and so you just have to do some sort of stochastic gradient descent to hope that you sort of try to find, try to minimize this loss function as best you can. But you can do a lot better with factorization machines because you can actually, um, let's say you have like a particular parameter theta, you can actually compute the partial derivative of the model output with respect to that parameter. And this is much more than you're typically able to do. So first of all, let's, let's actually prove this. Um, so, let's see here, I actually, what I want to do is just so that we have it for reference, um, I want to, well, no. Um, yeah, let's do this. Let us, if my computer will let me, I don't think it's going to let me. Okay, so. Okay, well, now it decides to let me. All right. So, these are the formulas that we're going to get at the end. And so let's actually, let's actually do these calculations. Um, so this is the model. And um, if we take the partial derivative of this with respect to W0, then W0 only appears here and there's no constant out front of it. And so the partial derivative is just one. Um, now, if we want to take the partial derivative with respect to WI, then the WIs only appear in this term and w, a particular WJ is being multiplied by XJ and all of the other WKs are gonna drop out because it's not WJ. And what you're gonna be left with is XJ. And so if theta is WI, the partial derivative is, partial derivative is going to be XI. Now we have to consider what happens when theta is VIF i.e. when um, theta is one of these inner products. Okay, so let's start doing calculations. So I'm going to say the partial derivative with respect to V um, I F, and I'm not going to include the commas because I don't think they're necessary here. Um, but otherwise the notation here has been very useful and it's, it's been fine. Um, no complaints. So we're going to take the sum, I'm going to use L equals one to N, then the sum from J equals L plus one to N, just because I don't want to reuse the I because the I is already here. So we're taking, so of course the partial, so if, if theta is VIF, so the partial derivative with respect to VIF of Y is equal to this thing that I'm writing out here. So we're going to have um, the inner product of VI and VJ times XI, XJ. So I'm going to write the X's first. So it's XL, XJ, and then the dot product, I'm going to write that as a sum. So this is going to be the sum and instead of G, I'm going to, instead of F, I'm going to use G. The sum from G equals one to K of VLG times VJG. Okay, and so what does this 
partial derivative equal to? Um, well, when is, so this is a little tricky and let's ha let's think about it. So when, um, so XL times XJ times this, this sum. So this is just a bunch of terms and we have to think about when is this term not going to be zero because there's going to be a lot of terms here that are zero because VIF only appears sometimes. It only appears when you're taking um, the dot product uh, in, it only appears when you're taking a dot product involving um, vector I. So, so this is only going to count when L equals I or when J equals I. Because if L, if, if neither L nor J is I, then none of these V, then neither VLG or VJG is ever going to equal VIF. And so that term will just be zero when you take the partial derivative. And so um, we have to consider what happens when L equals I and what happens when J equals I. And we only, um, and we don't have to consider any cases where they're both equal to I because L is never equal to J just because J starts at L plus one. Okay, so when L equals I, we have this sum. We have sum from J equals L plus one, so that's I plus one to N of X I, X J, because L equals I. And then um, here, um, I'll bring the partial derivative with respect to VIF in here. So it's the partial derivative with respect to VIF of the sum of v, VLG, VJG. So what's going to happen to all of these VLG, VJGs? So um, we know that I equals, or um, let's see here. So basically if G is not equal to F, then this is just gonna drop out because n neither of these are gonna be VIF. And we know that J is never going to be equal to I. So, oh, wait, but we got the LIs. Okay, so basically all we need to worry about is what happens when G e equals F? Because otherwise, th this is just two constants with, um, so it's partial derivative with respect to VIF is gonna be zero. Okay, so, um, it's the partial derivative with respect to VIF of this sum when G equals F. So that's going to be V I F times V J F. All right. So this is the term that we get when L equals I, but what about when J equals I, when J equals I, we have the sum from L equals one to N. L is kind of unfortunate of a letter to use because it looks so much like one, but like, what can you do? Then it's going to be X L times X. Well, this is X I because here J equals I for this term. Then we again have the partial derivative with respect to V I F of V and this time it's V L F V I. All right, and so then what is going to happen to these two terms? So what we can do is we can bring the xi out front and we get the sum from j equals i plus one to n of xj times, now this partial derivative, um, this is just a constant times VIF. And when you take the partial deriv derivative with, v with respect to VIF, the VIF drops out and you just get the constant, which in this case is VJF. So VJF plus, and then that second term, the XI again factors out and we get the sum from L equals one. Oh, I think I did something wrong here. Um, this is the sum from J equals one to I minus one. Yes, 
This is not the sum from L equals 1 to N. This is the sum from L equals 1 to I minus 1. And why is that the case? That is the case because here we're considering the case where J equals 1. And we know the sum goes from L equals 1 to N and the sum from J equals L plus 1 to N. So the fact that J equals the fact that J equals I, um, remember L can only go up to J minus one because J, J starts at L plus one. So L can only go up to J minus one. And in this case, J is equal to I. And so this sum starts at L equals one and, it, and L only goes up to I minus one. Because if L were greater than I minus one, then it couldn't be the case that J is equal to I. Okay, so that's why the sum is from j equals 1 to i minus 1. And why is there a j there? That should not be a j. No, it's fine, actually. Yeah, so basically what I'm doing here is this is... Um, Well, actually, here, let's let's do it like this. L equals 1 to I minus 1 times XL times VLF. Because for the same thing as before, the VIF drops out and we're left with the VLF. Okay. And so what we can do is we can replace these Ls. So L is just a indexing variable. So we can replace the Ls with, with Js. So... I'm going to do that. J, 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 F. Because this sum is separate from this sum. So like the scope of J in this sum is just, it only goes up to here. And so we can reuse the variable J here. But now look at this. this these terms are exactly the same except for the indexing set. This here J goes from one to I minus one. And here, j goes from i plus 1 to n. So if we want to make our lives easier, we could just have a, one single sum here that goes from j equals 1 all the way up to n of xj times vjf. However, this has an extra term in it. This has the, the term where j equals i, which was not included in either of these. So it, uh, And so we need to remove that. Um, and so what does that term look like when j equals i? We have xi times xi times vif and so we need to subtract that term and so we need to subtract v i f times xi squared and then we look up and we realize that these are exactly the same i mean sure i've this xj should be on the other side here if we want it to make it look exactly correct but um this is how this is how we we get this result um All right, and this is really important because this makes it really easy to um, estimate the parameters. And the reason it's really easy is because typically um, what we're trying to do is we have some loss function um, L. And what we do is if we have some point X, we want to determine the loss function of the model at that point x so we would like evaluate the loss function at the s at the the model prediction of y at the vector x um, but what i'm going to do here is i'm also going to include um no this is this this is all we need okay so the, the way that we train our models is we try to minimize this function, the loss function. And we, tr we try to minimize the loss function um, with respect to, to the parameters. And in order to minimize something, you basically find its derivative and you go in the direction of the function decreasing. And so in order to minimize this, what we want to do is we want to find the partial derivative of our loss function Evaluate it at the model, evaluate it at a point, find that partial derivative with respect to a particular model parameter, theta. 
So what, we're, what we want to, the, one of the calculations that we use when we're training our models is we want to take the partial derivative with respect to some parameter theta of L of y hat of x. And what we can do is we can use the chain rule here. So this is going to be, um, so let's see here, we have, we're taking the derivative of L of y of x. And so the first thing that we do is we take the derivative of L with respect to the, um, what's inside of it. And so, um, L is a, the, the value of the loss function is one dimensional, so this should be the partial, or this should be like the total derivative of L with respect to y hat. Um, is this correct? I'm pretty sure this is correct, but I'm not entirely, um, yeah, because all the cases that we've been talking about here have been cases where the output y is a uh, is a sing is, is a real uh, value, and so th these are all like um, so L is a function from R to R, and so it's the total derivative instead of the partial derivative. But I guess it doesn't matter. But it's this. So we have um, the partial so we have the derivative of L with respect to y evaluated at x times the partial derivative of y with respect to theta no 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 it's the it's the derivative it's this derivative evaluated here times the partial derivative of y with respect to theta at x. Um, but now, let's look at this. So typically, L is like a loss function. So it's um, uh, typically it's going to be like um, like an L two loss function, maybe. So it's it's basically going to be um, so L of y hat of x is typically going to be like. Um, we have this guess, and then we have like an actual true value of x given by y of x, and we're like taking um, like the norm of this or the norm squared because we want to minimize the distance between the model estimate and the actual value. Um, but if we look at this, like this, this, this is an easy function to take the derivative of. We can actually like take, taking the derivative of this with respect to y is something that we can do. Um, and then taking the partial derivative of y with respect to a particular parameter, parameter theta, we just show that we can do that. And so this is something that we can actually compute by hand. So instead of having to sort of like guess around and do like a stochastic gradient descent, um, well, let's see, thus the model parameters can be learned efficiently by gradient descent methods. So basically it's, 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 it's more that because you can compute the gradient efficiently and like, because you can compute the gradient like really quickly, you don't need to do a lot of guessing and checking. Like typically what you would need to do is you would need to like, um, you would need to, in, in order to understand what the partial derivative of L of Y of X is at a, with respect to a particular parameter, you would have to choose a bunch of X's um, and use those to estimate what the derivative is. Um, you could technically just use like two points, um, like just choose a point, like choose the point theta and then choose, um, then do um, the, the same thing, but with theta slightly different, um, and then use that to f compute the, um, the partial derivative. Um, but that's another model evaluation. And here, um, you can just compute it directly. And so this makes your lives 
a lot easier. All right, so that is how we can do, um, how, how we can use gradient descent um, and like compute the partial derivatives really easily. Um, so now we get to a section here on D-way factorization machines. So basically what we talked about previously was these factorization machines where you consider like the interaction between pairs of columns. Um, but what if we wanted to figure out more complex interactions, um, more than just pairs of interactions? Like what if we wanted to um, be able to understand like the interaction between three columns at the same time? Um, well, it turns out you can generalize um, your model like this and it would look like this. And this equation, um, this is a little bit tricky to get your, to wrap your head around. Um, but basically when, um, so basically, so this is the sum from L equals two to D. So each L represents, so, so the value of L represents um, how many columns you are considering the interactions of. So L equals two corresponds to um, you capture interactions between pairs of columns. Um, and L equals three corresponds to um, capturing interactions between triples of columns. Um, and let's actually just like write this out for L equals two just to see what it looks like um, to, to show you that it makes sense. So when L equals two, we have the sum from I one equals one to N. And then we have the sum from I two. So L equals two. And so this is where we're going to stop because we stop at I L. So I two equals I two minus one is one plus one to N. Then we have the product from J equals one to L of X I J. So this is the product from J equals one to two of X I J. And so that's just X I one times X I two. I'm not even going to write it in multiplication notation, but then what we have is we have this, we multiply by the sum from F equals one to K L. So this would be K two. So this is whatever value of K. So, t so in theory, you can use a different value of K for each um, L, but in practice, you probably wouldn't. And then what we do is within the sum, we, multiply V I J F for each of the J's. And here J goes from one to two because we're taking L equals two. So this is going to be V I one F times V I two F. So this is V I one F V I two F. And technically we, we would put these twos up here to note, to specify that we are referring to the pairwise interactions. Um, but remember, like if you go back, this is just the inner product of VI1 with VI2, or the dot product, inner, which I guess is the inner product. Um, but anyways, like th th this is exactly um, the sum that we had before, if you go back earlier in the paper. Yeah, right here, this, this sum is this sum. Um, and then like if you had, um, if you had D equals three, for example, then what you would have is you would, um, it would be x i. You would have i one equals one to n, i two equals i one plus one to n. You and then you'd also have i three equals i two plus one to n, and then you'd have x i one, x i two, x i three, and then you would sum up f i one f v i one f v i two f and v i three f. Right, which is which is in some sense is like a uh, in in some sort of dot product between the three vectors. VI1, VI2, and VI3. All right, so then what happens after here? So then, so they specify VIL, so this is gonna be N by KT. This is just like V from before, but we could have a different K for each, um, for each value of L. Now, it says a straightforward complexity for computing a the, the straightforward complexity for computing equation five is big O of KD times N to the D. And that makes sense. If you look at this, um, 
here, here we get um, this sum is um, KL and um, so when L equals D, we get KD um, here because that's where the sum is. And then if you look at these sums, how many of these sums are you going to have? You're going to have, you get, um, so you start from I1 and you go up to ID. So you're going to have D separate summations and each summation goes all the way up to N. So the complexity is N to the D. So N to the D times KD. And that's where we get n to the d times kd complexity. But with the same arguments as in lemma 3.1, one can show that it can be computed in linear time. Um, this is one of those like innocuous looking statements that mathematicians put in their papers that turns out to be very complicated. Um, and when I was reading this on my own, I was like, great, um, let's figure this out. And basically I looked at this and I was like, how do we, let's just consider like uh, D equals three. How, how does this generalize? Because um, what you would think is that like, oh, well maybe this sum instead of being squared, it becomes cubed. Um, and then you look at, um, maybe this sum should be I equals one to N, J equals one to N, and then K equals one to N. K's, we're already using K, so let's say L equals one to N. Um, but if you look at that, it like it gets really complicated because you have to consider like it's not just here what you have to um, you have to divide by two because you get um, the reorderings of I J and J I, um, and then you have to subtract all of the um, the squared interactions. It's even more complicated when you go up to three because if you have the sum from i equals one to n, j equals one to n, and l equals one to n, then you're not dividing by two, or you're not just dividing by three, you're dividing by six because what you're really doing is you're, you have to think of like if you have a particular value of i, a particular value of j, a particular value of l, you have to consider all the different ways you can order those. And it's, uh, it's three factorial ways of ordering those three symbols. And so that's six. And so you have to divide by six. Um, but then you have to subtract out all of the like cube terms. And so that's easy. But then you realize that you also have to subtract out any term where two of the symbols are the same. And then you, you, you think like, oh, well, there's also multiple ways of ordering these terms in which two symbols are the same. So let's say like I equals J or J equals L or I equals L. Um, and it gets really complicated and you realize like, like the, it's not reasonable to be able to, like it, there's no like real straightforward seeming way to do this. So it turns out that this isn't very straightforward and it took a separate paper to address this. So this first paper came out in 2010. This next paper came out in 2016. It's called Higher Order Factorization Machines. And so what they say is, um, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to see like where exactly they say, um, there. Unfortunately, although higher order factorization machines were briefly mentioned in the orig original work of 13 and 14, and that's the first paper we were looking at. There exists to date no efficient algorithm for training arbitrary order, high order factorization machines. So basically what they're saying is that they weren't, they, they're, these authors weren't aware of like an actual efficient implementation of the algorithm that the first author, author um, mentioned. And so what they do is in this paper, they actually discuss that. And that is what we are going to discuss.